food revolutions are those moments in history when changing the way we ate changed us forever. For those who haven't yet watched my previous videos on this, the first revolution was when we invented the knife, which enabled us to get more fat in our diets, which helped us grow bigger brains, which made us smart enough to control fire, which allowed us to cook and eat together, which led to the second and possibly most important turning point in the human story, and in my opinion, the most uniquely human advent of all time, the arrival of storytelling. Then, just a few short million or so years later, we learned how to plant our own food, which allowed us to stay in one place and build cities and invent civilization, so that agriculture became the third great food revolution. The fourth food revolution was the development of fermenting, and even though it had actually been around for billions of years, we changed our world when we learned to harness its power because it enabled us to do long-distance travel, trade, imperialism for better or worse, and may have even played a major role in the development of some of our spiritual paradigms. Okay, so now you're all caught up and ready to hear about the fifth great food revolution, which is... Drum roll, please! Oh my god, that is an anemic drum roll, but whatever. Introducing the fifth great food revolution, the most important historical event that you may never have heard of. The Columbian Exchange. Now let's start by playing a little make-believe. Now imagine a world, Indians with no horses, Italian food with no tomatoes, Thai food with no chilies, Ireland without potatoes, the West Coast with no coffee, Switzerland with no chocolate, no wheat in Kansas, no apples in America, much less apple pie, the entire North American continent without earthworms, no oranges in Florida, the West without tumbleweeds, the global food supply without corn. Well, just 500 years ago, that was all true. There were no horses in America and no tomatoes in Italy until the most important historic event that they probably didn't teach you in school known as the Columbian Exchange, a term coined by Alfred Crosby, not affiliated with Stills, Nash, Young, or Mad Magazine. But then in 1492, something happened that you probably have heard of. This dude Columbus navigated three ships across the Atlantic Ocean and thought he had found a shortcut to Asia. Now, time moved differently back then, and his so-called shortcut still required a couple of months, give or take a few weeks. So now, we really start to see how these revolutions build on one another. Transatlantic travel could not have been possible without fermented liquids to drink, since barrels of water would be unsafe long before they got here. There would have been no reason to make the journey if he hadn't been able to sell his story to Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand, who funded the enterprise, and they only did so to bolster their economy. The ships could not have been built without cutting tools. So thanks to the first four food revolutions, the fifth was possible. Because of all that history, Columbus was able to sail over the Atlantic in search of, well... A few things, but another thing they probably didn't teach you in school was that the real prize of the time was black pepper, which was literally worth more than gold. Now they just give away those little packets at fast food restaurants, but back then it was a luxury item. But black pepper didn't exist here at the time. What we did have were chili plants, which some claimed Columbus tried to pawn off as pepper, and that's why we still call them peppers. I haven't been able to verify that, but I do find it amusing. There are actually a lot of American things that the Europeans named incorrectly because they couldn't tell that a moose is actually a type of elk and that an elk is just a big deer and that Artemisia isn't sage or that pronghorn aren't antelope or that bison aren't actually buffalo. Sometimes we get things wrong, so it's usually best to just be humble. But I digress. We're supposed to be talking about the Columbian Exchange. When ships started traveling between the eastern and western hemispheres, there were a lot of non-human passengers, both known and unknown. There were microscopic stowaways like smallpox, yellow fever, and cholera, while other species were being transported very much on purpose, like cattle, chickens, pigs, and horses. And then there were some that were kind of in the middle, like bees. 
There were bees here before, but they weren't interested in pollinating the plants from the old world. But luckily for the European settlers, they had brought some of their own bees, really just for the honey. But it turned out that just as a matter of dumb luck, the bees that they brought over started pollinating their old world plants for them. But whether known or unknown, this trading of species between worlds is what's known as the Columbian Exchange, and it changed the world forever, sometimes deliberately, but sometimes in ways that nobody could have seen coming. In my opinion, the Columbian Exchange was an exercise in unforeseen consequences. The Europeans knew they were bringing over barrels of soil, for instance, but they had no idea that they were bringing earthworms with that soil, much less that those earthworms would end up changing the makeup and character of the forests here. And then there were some plants here that they simply could not wait to bring back to show and tell in Europe, like corn, potatoes, and that most highly prized, devil in disguise, tobacco. I once told an Indian friend of mine, you gave us tobacco and we gave you whiskey. We traded opioids for cocaine, cannabis for quinine. People from the East brought measles, whooping cough, smallpox, malaria, and so many other diseases, while the sole pathogenic contribution from the West was syphilis. And even that is somewhat debated. Part of the reason for that is that people from the East tended to live close to their livestock, and most of these diseases originated from those animals, like influenza from chickens, measles from cattle. People in the Americas tended to not domesticate livestock and so had fewer opportunities to pick up their icky germs. So let's talk about that image people tend to have of the Americas being this pristine wilderness unimpacted by human habitation and that those who were here lived mostly in sparsely separated nomadic bands. Well, it simply isn't true. Estimates differ, but there were likely at least 1.8 million people here in 1500, maybe a lot more. And they had been cultivating and farming and landscaping on scales that the Europeans simply didn't or couldn't see. By the time Lewis and Clark came poking around out here in the West, the native population had been decimated to about 600,000. The vast majority of Native Americans were already gone. They had no immunity to the diseases that had been accidentally brought over in the Columbian Exchange. It wasn't guns or technology that killed the Indians. It was smallpox, yellow fever, plague. Beginning in the 1500s, stowaway diseases wiped out somewhere between two-thirds and 90% of all the people here. We have lost to history most of the tribes, most of the cities, most of the languages, most of the culture and technology, and most of everything that was here. Most of the people here who died from old world diseases had never even heard of a white person. They were dying from diseases brought here by people they didn't even know existed. Now, contrary to popular belief, most of them lived in cities, but those cities were the absolute worst place to be when the diseases came through. If you have an image of most Indians living out in nature in thinly populated groups, think again and think about it. That's just who was left by the time the Euro-Americans started exploring. Those are just the people who had been spared when the densely populated cities were wiped out by disease. So you need to reimagine your idea of the Americas. There were huge cities here, technological advancements that the old world hadn't dreamed of. Incredible achievements in agriculture, astronomy, hydrology, permaculture, and governance that were well beyond anything happening in the old world at the time. And it was all but erased by invisible invaders born of pigs, chicken, horses, and cattle. Now remember, Europe was in the Middle Ages in the 1500s. The people who came here were coming from medieval culture. This notion of their being more advanced than the Indians is absolute hogwash. The Indians weren't perfect by any means. A lot of their nations had war, slavery, class stratification, and whatever other awful else's that may have been lost to us, but suffice to say, they were people, and people have problems. But it's completely ridiculous to assume that they were at all primitive and technologically behind Europe. And what about those expansive herds of millions of buffalo roaming across the western plains? Well, they probably didn't exist when Columbus first got here. You see, humans at the time were the keystone predator of the buffalo. They likely hunted them in sufficient numbers so as to keep their population in check. But when the diseases wiped out all the people, there was probably an explosion of the buffalo population. So those inconceivably large herds that Lewis and Clark described had probably only existed for a couple hundred years or so. Now, as for the horses, they're an interesting story. 
Horses first evolved here in the Americas, and then during the Ice Age, they migrated over the Bering Strait into Asia, where they were domesticated by people in modern-day Kazakhstan. The ones who stayed here went extinct. So when the Spanish first brought horses over here, they were actually reintroducing them. I guess it was a kind of a horsey homecoming for the horses. I think Italy is a kind of an interesting case too. I mean, before the Columbian Exchange, they had no tomatoes and no peppers. They probably didn't have noodles before Marco Polo brought them home from China. Though some people dispute that, and those people mostly are you know, Italian foodies, of course. Go figure. But what the heck were they eating in the before time? Italian food without tomatoes or noodles? Hard to imagine. Flatbread and pesto with a side of pesto and flatbread served on a flatbread with pesto. Actually, you know what? That, that actually sounds kind of good. But there was a lot more. On the eastbound ships traveling from the Americas to Eurasia and Africa were tomatoes, potatoes, cocoa, corn, most beans, peanuts, pineapple, avocado, sweet potato, tobacco, squash, turkey, cassava, and a lot more. While traveling on the westbound ships to the Americas, we had horses, cattle, chickens, wheat, barley, rice, and oats, coffee, citrus, fruits, apples, grapes, earthworms, turnips, onions, olives, and a veritable who's who of diseases, including smallpox, malaria, whooping cough, cholera, measles, influenza, and a lot more, and the impact is impossible to overstate. In a word, the Colombian exchange was very literally the beginning of globalization, now, I've so far described these food revolutions as times when changing the way we ate changed us forever, and while that's very much the case here, one of the interesting things about the Columbian Exchange is that it went both ways. The food changed us, and then we changed the food, which changed us some more, changing the food again, and it became a literal positive feedback loop. The more we changed, the more those changes led to more change. The Columbian Exchange has been described by Charles Mann, one of my all-time favorite authors, as the biggest ecological convulsion since the death of the dinosaurs, and that is no exaggeration. Nothing in 65 million years on this planet can even come close. It changed us forever, and it changed the entire planet forever, and we haven't even gotten to the big story yet. There were a couple of non-living things that started crossing the oceans that also reinvented us and our world forever. Firstly, there was Mount Potosi in Bolivia, which to this day is the largest silver find in history. It's practically a mountain made of silver and pretty much doubled the global silver supply almost overnight. And that silver was claimed by the Spanish who promptly brought it to China, who had previously never taken Europe the least bit seriously. China in 1500 was far more powerful, advanced, cultured, sophisticated, and wealthy than all of Europe put together. They basically thought of Europe as a bunch of backward simps. But when the Spanish showed up with shiploads of silver, they suddenly started taking them very seriously. So suddenly, a new trade was opened up. The Spanish showed up with silver that they traded for silk and porcelain and spices, which they carried off and stopping in the Americas to pick up some rum, tobacco, and sugar, traded in Europe for guns and horses, which they took to Africa, to trade for slaves, which they took to Mount Potosi to mine the silver that they took to China to start the whole thing over. Now, it's important to not be cavalier about the abominable suffering that results from human bondage. But when you look at the process, you can see that this was the very beginning of globalization. It started right there. And silver was hardly a sidebar in comparison to the other non-living item on the manifest of the Columbian Exchange. I mean, silver was cool, but this next item was very literally the sh**. Remember a while back when I told you that plants need nitrogen and can't take it directly from the air? Well, one of the best mechanisms for delivering nitrogen to plants is manure, excrement, poop. And while the Spanish were traveling around the coast of Peru one day, they found entire cliffs that were made of solid bird poop. Seriously, islands of poo, also known as guano. Now, up to this point, the main commercial fertilizer being used in Eurasia was bone meal, which was often harvested from battlefields. Gruesome as it is, grave robbers used to pull the bodies from the fields, have the bones ground up, and then they sold those ground up bones as fertilizer. It was observed at the time that some farmers may have literally been feeding the bones of their own sons to the fields. <sighs> oh, that's rough. But then the guano age came along. 
the bird poop was a superior fertilizer, and it was just sitting there for the taking, if you could handle the smell, which was not easy to do. The workers on those islands were often working against their will, and the suicide rate was extremely high. They sometimes worked 20-hour back-breaking days in air that was hardly breathable, and the impact of guano on the agriculture changed the world forever. Whereas up to that point, there had always been a limit to how much yield any given piece of land could produce, suddenly that yield could be increased seemingly without limit through the use of guano. Seemingly. But we'll get to that. Because of this, farmers could engage in intensive monoculture. They could grow the same crop season after season after season in the same place because they could add guano. Another word for that guano was fertilizer, also known as chemical input, and this was the beginning of what's now known as input-intensive farming. By importing chemical inputs in the form of guano fertilizer, it was now possible to increase crop yields far beyond what had been possible with the native soil of a place. So it may be that more than any organisms or crops, more than tomatoes, corn, potatoes, apples, earthworms, chocolate, or any invisible pathogen, it was the industrial application of fertilizer that changed the fundamental framework of society on a global scale in ways that are still in place today. Something as humble as bird sh Talk about unforeseen consequences. I mean, nobody saw that coming. But bird sh has changed nations, fed billions, built empires, caused international disputes. It led to the development of industrial monoculture, which is still, for better or worse, the backbone of the agricultural economy. It's an incredibly rich topic, and a lot of books have been written on it. This is my favorite one, 1493, by Charles Mann, who, as I said, is one of my all-time favorite authors. In fact, I recommend this book so highly that I'm going to give away this brand new copy to the first person to post a comment in the comments section. And even if you don't win the book, I really do invite you to leave comments. I want this to be a conversation, and that's the best way to do it. And I won't lie, it also helps the channel by telling the almighty algorithm that you think this is an interesting topic. Of course, you can also help by clicking on like, subscribe, notify, and all those other deliciously smashable things. And I do love this topic. There's going to be at least one more video on this one before moving on to revolution number six, which is one you probably have heard of, and it's going to be a lot of fun too. But for now, it's time to wrap up this video. Thanks so much for watching. Hope to see you next time. Ciao.